Why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you tell your family? Why didn't you go to a women's shelter? You just hate men. Do I know him? Did you think about this before having children? You should just leave. Just call the police. Just get a restraining order. Just leave. What did you do to make him mad? It must have been something you did. You just like to complain. You just want to play the victim. You must have made him angry. It's your own fault. You must you like it if you didn't leave. Do you still love him? Well, do you? You must like it and be in a... Were you desperate for a man? If I help you leave, you'll just go back to him. You'll just go back. That could never happen to someone like you. Where are the bruises? Where are the bruises? Can't be that bad. You're overreacting. He'd never do that. He's such a nice guy. He coaches the kids' sports teams. Mows the neighbor's lawns. He'd never do that. Must have just called the police. Why did he never do that? Never do that. Call the police. Hey, just leave. He's a nice guy. I am. I am a loving mom, grandma, wife, and friend. I am a loyal friend and a pain in the ass sister. I am a parent, advocate, peacemaker, and educator of many things. I am a proud single mom, nursing professional, and Navy veteran. I am an inspiration, a warrior, a force to be reckoned with. I am a diva. Yo soy Latina. I am a thinker, a learner, a lover. I am difficult to keep down. I am a nurse, an advocate, and a God-fearing woman. I am me. I am enough. I am a beautiful flower. I am a professor. I am a daycare provider and a mother of three beautiful boys. I am a creator, a motivator, a poet, a woman. I fell in love with him. I fell. And in the beginning, his genuine concern for my safety was impressive. He cared. He would borrow my vehicle once in a while. I did my sharing, but gradually and purposefully, he took control of my daily decisions and routines. In no time, he firmly assumed the role of head of household and primary driver of my car. He started to occupy all of my free time and alienated my friends. He had to know everything I was doing down to the smallest details. And I was always being accused of flirting with other men. His friends, landlords, co-workers, men at church. If it was a male figure, I was having an affair with him. I could barely talk to my male friends or even my female friends for that matter. He had to know where I was, who I was with, and what I was doing every minute of every day. I had to call him at certain times. I remember driving down the road and getting nervous because it was 2.30 and I couldn't find a payphone. It was easier to plan my whole day around my 9.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. call-ins. I even had to attend his fishing club meetings with him. If I didn't, that would leave a two-hour window of time in which he wouldn't know what I was doing. I hate fishing. My every activity. My every behavior. Was controlled. He convinced me we should have only a joint bank account and that he should manage the finances because it caused me too much stress. He was doing it for me. And yet most of the money he controlled was my income. He was in and out of low-wage jobs throughout our entire relationship. <clears throat> he professed in tears that he was falling in love with me. He was afraid that I would hurt him. He lied. He borrowed money when I tried to break things off, slow down for a while, or get some space. He sobbed, threw things at the wall, and threatened suicide until I gave in. Then all was wonderful again, and we were meant to be together. It was faded. 
He started hating the neighbors. He hated the neighbor's cat. He hated my friends. He hated my cat. He started to hate my family. I thought he loved me and was just being protective. I watched him one night grab my cat by the throat and throw him across the kitchen. Scribbles had been playing with the bottom of the comforter. He didn't like me talking to anyone about what went on in our house. From the outside, we were a perfectly happy couple. We spent most of our Thanksgivings and Christmases alone. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Alone, I stare at twinkling lights, presents neatly wrapped, stocking tongue, cookies and milk awake Santa, awake Santa. Children sleeping, a rare moment of silence. Car pulls in driveway, stumbling in door slam, yelling my name. Shh, you're waking kids. Shut the fuck up, you dumb bitch. Baby, I'm sorry, I didn't want to upset you. It was Christmas time and I just got them to sleep. Tree crashing, lights shattering, face cracking. <laughs> Silence shattered. Presents flying. Children crying. Daddy's home. See what you made me do, bitch? Calm them down and fix this shit. I'm going to bed. Door slams. Children sobbing. Head throbbing. Heart shattered. Dreams scattered. I've got to make this right. Sleep, baby. Santa will come and make it better. Mommy, will Santa bring us a nice daddy? Tears fill my eyes as I sing them to sleep. Fix the tree, restring the lights, sweet broken glass, restore shattered dreams. Mommy, Fixes everything. In the morning, everything will be okay. Silent night, silent fight, lonely fight. Everything will be all right. Don't tell anyone our secret. Within the first year or two, we had spent the weekend arguing about something. That weekend was the first time that he had hit me. I went into work Monday morning happy to be there after the weekend that I, the terrible weekend I had had. I worked in a small office at the time. I heard that someone come through the front door and I heard the flower, I heard one of the girls in the front of the office say, Oh, well, those are beautiful. I heard the flower delivery man say my name. I didn't want to get up, I was too embarrassed. But I stepped out of my cubicle and around the corner to see the perfect bouquet of a dozen long stemmed red roses and a beautiful glass face. Wow, what do you do this weekend? Oh, it looks like someone's going to be a happy man tonight. What did you do to deserve those? The card was written in his handwriting. It said, thanks for the wonderful weekend. I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna look ungrateful. So I smiled on the outside. He worked to win everyone over. He did electrical jobs for my family. He volunteered. He mowed the neighbor's lawns. He was the kid's favorite coach. He knew how to keep the outside world from seeing in. But behind the steel door with no windows to let light shine through. You'll never amount to anything. I'll find someone at work to give me some if you won't. You're incapable of love. You ugly whore. I wasn't upset.
You're a no good one way motherfucker. Oh, I will find you, please. I will throw battery acid on your face so no man ever wants to look at you again. I'll kill you and your family if you tell anyone. I will carve my initials in your face. That doesn't even compare to what you've done. You just don't understand how difficult my life was before I met you. I wasn't upset. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm walking on eggshells around you. You overreacted. You're overreacting. When we fought, he would break things, rip clothes, and push me. Though at first, it was just a push or shove. At first, it was only a push or a shove. Approaching me, rage in his eyes sends shivers down my spine. Will I die tonight? He grabs my hair and yanks me to my feet, throws me on the bed, leans in, kissing me hard, violently ripping off my nightshirt. Dirty bitch, he screams. He spits in his face. My blood. His saliva, sting of his open palm against my face. I go still. Don't fight back. He'll leave me alone. Floppy hands boring my breast, squeezing my nipples. Fresh tears well flow down my cheeks. He stabbed into me. His penis like a knife ripping my body apart. Each thrust brings fresh face of pain and humiliation. You're a dumb, ugly whore. You deserve this. No one will ever love a useless piece of shit like you. Eyes closed. I will my mind to drift to a place. I can no longer feel the pain. I don't know what finally caused me to escape. I knew I had to get away. I thought to myself, it's now or never. I have to save the life of my children. <clears throat> I ran from the tortured cell I called home, but no matter how fast, the mem how fast I ran, the memories were never far behind. I was eight months pregnant. I knew I couldn't bring a baby into this world under these conditions. And on a day like any other, he slammed me into the car full force. I was sure I was gonna miscarry. Once I was able to convince him to let me go to the hospital, I made a decision to never let him hurt this baby again. I never went to the hospital that day. I went home and told my parents I needed their help. I needed help. I need help. I could not get away on my own and I was terrified of what he would do. My parents helped me get a restraining order and promised they would protect me. For almost two years on a daily basis, he would make some attempt to get to me. He would call, drive by, and break into my parents' home. One night, my father found him in my room when I was out and chased him down the street. He caught him and held him down until the police arrived. We realized later that he tried to start a fire in my closet. And this is what it's like. Even after making the break, he continued to haunt my life and control my thoughts. He stalked me. He called me incessantly at work. Broke into my home. Wrote me long love letters. Violated the restraining order. Despite raping me and abusing my children, he was awarded visitation rights. He became obsessed with finding me. With getting me back. With proving me wrong. I try hiding with family, staying in shelters and relocating. All of this heightened his obsession with me. His ability to quickly locate me made me ever more fearful. I lost confidence in the system's ability to protect me. And still today, Things haven't changed. He keeps harassing me and threatening me. Just recently, he sent a poem he wrote in prison. 
it ended. The time is coming. Tick tock, tick tock. I remember taking a bus home from work. He had smashed my car windows again and I couldn't drive. All of a sudden, he appeared on the bus and offered me a ride home. When I, I refused, he started to make a scene. The bus driver would not leave until he got off the bus and he would not get off the bus until I agreed to go with him. I felt helpless. Not even the bus driver would help. So eventually I got off the bus. We were in the middle of the city. When I wouldn't go with him to get in his car, he started dragging me by my hair. I was crying and asking people to help, but they just kept walking by like nothing was happening. He drove me around that night until 2 a.m., smacking me and calling me names. He spit in my face. And the next day, with no sleep and no car, I took the bus to work again. One night, I stood in the pouring rain wearing nothing but a torn t-shirt clutching my 10 month old son. As I struggled to escape, cars passed by left and right and no one stopped. People slowed down to stare, but no one stopped. I remember standing there with his words echoing in my head. No one is going to help you. Nobody's going to help you. Nobody is going to help you. No one should stand alone in the rain. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tanya King Harris, and I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Thank you for joining us tonight in solidarity with survivors of domestic violence. We recognize the experiences shared through behind closed doors reading can be and are triggering. Take care of yourselves, however that looks for you, and know that we are here, we are open. If you or someone you know may be experiencing domestic abuse or need supportive services like counseling, please contact the confidential 24 seven statewide helpline at 1-800-494-8100 or through the online chat feature at rickadv.org. That's R-I-C-A-D-V dot O-R-G. We are tremendously grateful to the members of the Rick Adivi's Survivor Task Force SOAR, Sisters Overcoming Abusive Relationships, for all the strength, time, and energy they poured into this event, sharing glimpses of their experiences with you. As a survivor, their stories resonated with me and inspired me. Strength is something all survivors have an abundance of. Strength can look like reaching out for support for the first time finding enough resources to leave an abusive relationship or finding the strength to wake up and move on with a new day when leaving is not an option. Every survivor is strong and their stories, perspectives and voice matter. Thank you again for joining us this evening and thank you to the always inspiring members of SOAR. I'd now like to turn this over to the members of SOAR and Alyssa Mae Franklin, SOAR coordinator. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you to the members of SOAR for that incredible performance and for sharing these moving and powerful stories tonight. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Alyssa Mae Franklin, and I coordinate um, Sisters Overcoming Abusive Relationships, SOAR, at the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, I'll be moderating the Q&A section of our event tonight um, where we can delve a little bit more into these important topics and um, engage you all in a, a conversation about domestic violence. Um, the excerpts that were shared in this performance tonight of Behind Closed Doors were shared to dispel some of the myths about domestic violence. And this is part of the mission of SOAR to raise up the voices and experiences of survivors to educate about domestic violence and to make long lasting change for survivors and their children. We want every member of our community to know about the dynamics of domestic violence and to know what takes place in abusive relationships so that we are better equipped to step in and support survivors and to prevent domestic violence from happening in the future. Um, so to help us continue this conversation, we're now going to hear more from our SOAR members um, to help us better understand domestic violence and the experiences of survivors. 
And if you have a question that you would like us to address, please feel free to put that in the Q&A section, which can be found at the bottom of your screen um, or in the chat if you um, select all panelists and we can do our best to get to that. Um, so the first question that we're gonna start with tonight um, is what does being a survivor mean to you? And I'm gonna direct this question to Laura and then Robin. Laura. Hi. To me, being a survivor means having the experiences to understand and help others know abuse is never okay. On the inside, I'm a very passionate, caring, and sensitive person and therefore want to help others. Through all of my trainings with SOAR, nonviolence, and research, I have become more aware of the complexities of domestic violence and the laws and procedures in place that we need to change. After surviving domestic violence in all its forms, it took me many years after ending the abusive relationship to be able to even talk about it in front of others. I am sensitive to my experience, but know that it is important to share them in order, um, share them in the hope that I can get through to at least one person. Maybe I can help them know there are people who understand and who know how hard it is, but worth it to get help. Thank you so much, Laura. Robin? Yes, thank you. Being a survivor means being a strong person, being able to be here to tell my story and share my experiences to help others. It means not being afraid to use my voice to help others and to change things for the future so that survivors in the future don't have to hopefully experience some of the hardships that I went through. I always felt like if I let him beat me down, then he wins. Being a survivor, you have to be a strong person in the end, and things eventually will get better. Thank you so much, Robin. Mm -hmm. This next question I want to direct to Savannah, and this is about this uh, time that we've been living in, COVID-19 and the pandemic. And um, I want to ask uh, you, Savannah, how, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted you as a survivor? Thank you. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic hit many people. For me personally, it triggered a lot with my mental health. It caused increased anxiety. Um, it triggered me in a lot of ways with being told not to go out, we had to stay in and limiting the, the government saying to limit the number of people that we were interacting with. Those are all very common things I heard through my abuser and it was just being repeated and triggering me back there. I was also very isolated at the time the pandemic hit, me and my kids were living in a shelter. Um, so getting out wasn't, wasn't super plausible for us. I was worried that we would lose connections that we had worked to rebuild since the domestic violence relationships had ended. We didn't have much support around us and it was just me and my two daughters within the shelter at the time. So isolation was definitely a, a big impact of the COVID-19. Thank you so much for sharing that, Savannah. And I know many, many of you listening here tonight um, have been personally affected or know someone who's been personally affected by domestic violence. And um, so this next question we have, and, um, and I am seeing some um, questions come in, which is wonderful. Um, this next question we have is, how do I support someone who is a domestic violence survivor? What, what is the best thing to do um, to support that person? Um, Damaris, can you speak to that? Sure, thank you. Um, how can I support someone? Um, I think it's important for us to listen, to uh, not be judgmental. Um, we know that it takes seven attempts at least to leave um, before a survivor leaves for good. So sometimes we can get discouraged when we listen and we try to help people but don't get discouraged don't allow them to be more isolated you know just stay in touch with them always um, i think it's important education education helps prevention also to educate ourselves and have the information and the resources whenever we need to refer a person to a service or to get help and i i also noticed that um it's important to um, empower people to take care of themselves. When we notice the self-care, kind of like people are withdrawing and not taking care of themselves, it's important to stay there and empower them and, and encourage them. Um, uh, you know, bring up the uh, self-care as, as a 
way to bring up the conversation, what's going on. You know, I notice that you're withdrawn, you're not taking care of yourself, you're not sleeping, are you eating well? Those are pointers that will help you kind of start this conversation with someone that is going through domestic violence. My mom did it with me all the time. She noticed that I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, something was wrong. So she didn't judge me. She kept in contact and she was just there until one time I said, I can't anymore, you know, and she helped me find the resources I needed. Um, being concerned with the people, you notice the changes. Um, and, and that also give them, they feel value. You know, they feel value. Not everybody turned their back. Someone is looking for me. Someone is caring for me when I can care for myself. So it's important to always listen and be there. Thank you so much, Damaris, for sharing that. Um, so we're going to take a question from uh, another question from the audience. And uh, Kathy, would you like to answer this question? Um, the question is that knowing some survivors are years out from abuse and some are still going through it in many ways. What's it like to perform this play? Kathy, do you want to answer that? Sure. So I, I can only sp I, speaking for myself. I was years out from my abuse and I had spent many years just trying to move forward. My goal was to just not look back. Um, doing this performance was um, very eye-opening and cathartic for me because I, I did have to kind of look back at some of the things that um, I, I thought I had buried, right? But I had not buried. So um, I think I forgot the second half of that question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, what, what's the experience like performing this play? Oh, yeah. So I think for all of us, um, the the woman who I began this journey with and the woman who have joined us since, um, we've, we've just, um, we've experienced a lot of, um, we talk about self-care a lot because we do, it does bring you back. You don't ever really get over, I don't think, the um, abuse. I think it's always there. And we always think that if we just ignore it, it will, you know, we can move on. But it, it really doesn't work that way. And so having this group of women who I, are amazing, um, supporting one another, has been a, a huge, huge for me. And I didn't even really know I needed it until I got involved with them. So um, they have they have been, uh, you know, a, a, a great support for me and my advice to people, whether they're just getting out or they've been out for a long time, is to reach out to somebody and have those conversations. Because even though you think that you've moved on, um, it's it, it never goes away. It never goes away. So it's great to have the support of people who understand what you what you've been through and what you're going through. Thanks, Kathy. Um, this next question, Christy, would you like to answer this one? Um, how are children impacted by domestic violence and what can we do to help support children who have experienced this? Yes, thank you. Um, oh, Christy, we lost your sound. Christy, can you hear us? Okay, we'll come. We lost your sound, Christy. I'm sorry. We'll come back to you. <laughs> this didn't happen. Um, it definitely trauma definitely has impacted her. And working in healthcare, I see kids every day that it mentally impacts them. Um, so part of what we need to be really self aware and again, self care is going to come up. Um, making sure that you're showing your children that you're taking care of yourself, whether that's um, joining a support group, getting counseling for yourself. Um, but also you don't want to pass that along to the next generation of domestic violence is the norm because it's not healthy. Um, so showing them also that there can be loving and caring relationships that don't include domestic violence and that um, people really do you actually love and care for you without being physically or emotionally abusive towards you? Um, so just again, self-care, mental health, making sure that our kids are also looked out after um, if they need to go to counseling as well or talk to someone beside you and just really be open and honest. Um, I know my daughter's biggest fear is that something will happen again, especially in
Christy, we lost your sound. Well, Christy, I'm sorry. We, lost, we had lost your sound for a little bit there and you were saying some great things and I'm, yeah, okay. I'm sorry that sorry. we missed it. Oh no, what happened? Um, what did you um, her, you had ended with her greatest fear. Was it happening again? Um, I don't know. So I was just going to say that it was their greatest fear of it happening again. And just making sure that you show them loving and caring relationships that don't include domestic violence or emotional abuse. Um, and sh she just has, you know, which is part of being exposed to trauma and domestic violence. She's really protective of me. So you want to make sure you take care of your kids because we know generationally that it can be passed along to children if they've witnessed or been around domestic violence and trauma. And you want to make sure that that doesn't go down to the next generation, that they are certainly, um, you know, seek counseling or support system and are open and honest. Thank you. And we'll certainly be sharing resources too. I know it's, um, it's, it can be challenging to find, you know, the right supportive services um, for your family. We'll be sharing uh, resources at the end that can hopefully be helpful um, to anyone on this call who is looking for those. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, and Zyda, if uh, you are uh, able to answer this question, which is what has been the most impactful advice that you've received um, from other survivors or, or for yourself? What's been the most impactful advice? Um, definitely the most impactful advice um, was when I was thinking of leaving the relationship. The man who abused me was in prison. Um, this was when I was planning, figured it'd be the safest time to leave, but I was also, even though he was in prison, I was still very much afraid of him. Um, so I went to a support group and when I finally spoke, I told them everything. I just, you know, it's like having a bad stomach ache and just getting everything out. Um, I told them absolutely everything. And um, he was a very well-known um, drug dealer. Um, everybody knew that he'd shoot or stab anyone. He didn't care who he did it in front of. So when I stated this, stated his record, um, what he had done to other people and what he had done to me, um, where guns and knives were involved, she told me, you need to leave the state. You need to leave. There's no way um, you can be here when he gets out of jail. And um, it took some courage, but I was able you know, I, I will never forget this person ever and, um, and her advice to me. And I was able to get out the state and get a restraining order when I did return and follow all her instructions, um, just being so caring and concerned about my safety was the best advice she could have ever given me. Thank you so much, Laida. Um, we have another question, um, about talking to young people. And, uh, so Allison, if you'd like to answer this question, how can you talk to young people about domestic violence? What are some ways that you can talk to them about it and, and, um, hopefully support them and prevent it from happening in the future? Sure. Well, it starts with awareness, really. It's so important to talk to children about domestic violence and intimate partner violence openly, talking about it at home, allowing your children to learn about it in school, and just making sure that they're aware of it um, on all levels, um, and also teaching healthy relationships along with that. Um, for example, it's really important to acknowledge when someone doesn't speak to you or treat you right. I mean, these situations come up with children all the time. So it's so important for us to reinforce these um, healthy habits and relationships. And um, I mean, the teacher and me would say teaching and modeling boundaries is probably one of the most important things you can do with children to teach them healthy relationships. I mean, everyone deserves boundaries to preserve their own needs and allow them to feel safe. And these are both physical boundaries and emotional boundaries. Um, and 
taking the opportunity to practice this with kids when they're going through um, interpersonal conflicts, dealing with their friends, trying to get along with their friends um, in moments when they're, you know, respecting their parents, but also respecting their own needs and boundaries. It's so important to practice this with kids every day. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so we have another question and um, for any of the SOAR members who wanna answer this one, um, you can feel free to let me know. Um, so the question is, given how difficult the pandemic has been for everyone, um, concerns have been raised about being cooped up with spouses. What advice would you give to those in abusive relationships who are unable to get out due to the quarantine? Is there anyone who would be willing to answer that question? Patricia? I think that um, sometimes we, you know, people may think that the most important thing is getting out and the most important thing is getting out, but safely. And each and every one of us has at some point gone through isolation through the relationship that was abusive. That's one of the first things that that happens. Um, so I would say the best thing is to keep yourself safe while you are in we, some of us call it incarceration because we're basically locked in, um, having to deal with situations that no one should have to deal with. Um, for myself, I had to keep myself and my children safe until I was able to get out. And um, sometimes that meant taking the children out of the home um, to play or to go to you know, family members. So that and also... Um, you know, if, if you have someone that can check in on you, you know, in a very discreet and very careful way, or, um, you know, even coding someone, like giving someone a code if you're in danger. Um, and that could be anybody. So just keeping yourself at faith as possible. Thanks, Patricia. Kathy, do you want to add on to that? But um, I agree with Patricia, um, you know, it is about safety and surviving. So um, getting out during that time is just not always an option, but um, maintaining the relationships that you have with people and, um, and continuing the, the conversations or, or communication so that you don't become even more isolated. A lot of women or, or you know, people in abusive relationships um, lost their jobs. And so they were home with their abuser. Um, their finances were impacted by that. So they couldn't, you know, they didn't have the freedom to, you know, come and go with gas in the car, whatever the situation was. So it, it would automatically in some cases be much more isolating. So any, any connection that you can maintain, whether it's work, you know, even if it's the pretense that you need to check in on work or whatever, just maintain as many, um, of those connections as you can. And like Patricia said, you know, just um, reach out where you can when it's safe because safety is the, is the first key. Um, it's, it's not, the getting out is not the only, the only thing, you know, surviving before you get out is, is paramount, so. Thank you, thank you both for answering that. Um, Kelly, yeah, go ahead. I also wanted to add, um, I, I've heard a lot of people say, and even I've said this until someone brought it up to me. It's like, you know, I, I need the courage to leave, but oftentimes um, you also have the courage to stay yeah. uh, for the kids um, and for your own safety. Um, so everything that everyone has said is definitely absolutely relevant. Um, it's, it's scary times these days. But I just wanted to add that in case anyone out there in the audience is feeling like you don't have the courage, you have the courage um, in, in, you know, it, for your situation um, to stay, especially with children. But, you know, um, at the end, you're, you're going to get the resources. But at any given, you, know, you see that window of opportunity. It's like, you know, take it. It's safety plan. Absolutely safety plan. 
Absolutely. Thank you for adding that, Callie. Um, we have one more question I want to see if, if any SOAR members um, open to answering, which is, um, is it possible to be a victim of abuse without experiencing physical violence? What other types of violence might a survivor experience? Is anyone open to answering that? Um, Zaida and Lisa? Um, for me, the, um, the verbal abuse was, was huge. Um, sometimes I'd be like, oh God, just get it over with and hit me um, because the verbal um, financial abuse, um, having every penny counted for when I went to the store, um, every penny had to be counted for and I had to return with a receipt and the change and you know you're so flustered um that sometimes you forget or you drop the receipt so many things that happen um so verbal abuse financial abuse um where you know you don't have to be hit being humiliated in public um lack of sleep he used to come home and wake me up at three four o'clock in the morning um, at any given moment, I had to um, be prepared to have sex with him. I had to be prepared to cook for him. And, and that alone, you know, just constantly waiting for, for, for all these things that you knew he would do, you know, I, I at times would be just hit me and get it over with because at least you hit me. I don't I don't have to get up. I don't have to have sex with you. I don't have to hear these awful words that, you know, that just stay with you. It's like nightmarish. So there are, you know, you don't have to be getting hit um, to be abused. Thank you, Zaida. Um, and then Lisa, I think I saw a hand. Yeah, my, uh, my relationship was over a decade ago, but one is so I was a lot younger. But one of the things that I didn't realize at the time, and I didn't realize until a lot later in life was that I was even in a domestic violence relationship. And I had a gun put to my head and was in a criminal, you know, court case involved, and still even then did not identify or see myself as a victim because I was never hit or I was never kicked. And so for me, even though there was a gun to my head, and I was being threatened, that didn't, that didn't, um, e equal domestic violence. And, you know, we often talk about the different types of domestic violence and uh, financial abuse was one that I, that certainly applied to me. I was working with the person. We owned a business together. Um, I was never able to keep my money. It always went to the bills and it always went to them and, you know, the allowances and you hear a lot about the financial abuse. So, you know, just thinking about different types of abuse, you know, emotional abuse was just mentioned, but um, a lot of times there's intersectionality and people experience lots of different things. Um, and it, and, you know, there's a cycle of violence. And so for me, I stayed in that honeymoon good phase for a really long time. And so when those situations would come up that were, you know, violent or, um, you know, not what I would consider like a healthy relationship, um, I always just justified it. And with the victim blaming and the gaslighting, a lot of times I thought it was my fault or I did something. So um, again, I think all of that is just part of the cycle of, of violence. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, was there anyone else who wanted to respond to that question? I could. I was going to. Oh, okay. oh sorry. go ahead. <laughs> Robin, then Damaris. Thanks. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was just going to add, I can mirror a lot of what Zaida said as well. Um, definitely the sexual abuse um, to the point of, I believe he was slipping something into my drinks um, before bed. And I would sleep so heavily that he was actually videoing having sexual intercourse with me and then shared it later on through social media, um, you know, pornographic pictures of myself, um, videos that he had taken of having sexual intercourse with me while I was sleeping. Um, definitely the financial piece, you know, taking my debit card while I'm sleeping and just draining my account when he didn't work. Um, the emotional piece is making me embarrassed to you know, say what was going on inside of our home, because I didn't want people to know that I was experiencing all these pieces and people judging me. Um, it was just like close, close people to me that I could really trust. But to a lot of others, I was making it seem like we were the happy couple. 
um, just like in the play, you know, like letting people know that I was okay, but I really wasn't okay. Um, but being able to play it off and until it got to the, the end there. Um, and just like Zida said, I wish there was more physical at one point because at least then, you know, I wouldn't have to deal with all those other pieces of um, the emotional aspects of it or, you know, the having sex when I didn't want to have sex or, um, you know, not having the financial piece to be able to try and safely leave. It was so many barriers that you don't realize happen. Um, and trying to make that safety plan was even more difficult as time went on. And so for 10 years, you know, I just let it keep building up. Um, and then luckily was able to find that out um, when it did finally get physical um, and was able to escape. But yeah, so just really was pieces of, you know, things you don't expect or, you know, you, you think that you know somebody and clearly you don't know them as well as you thought you did. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Damaris, and I think that will be our, our last question. We'll transition. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. you. Sure. I could add um, everything is presented um, as a joke. It could be presented as a joke, a slap, and you're behind. Oh, you know, you say, I don't like that, and they keep doing it. Um, that's, that's abuse. It's not respecting you. Um, it could be um, maybe not hitting you right into your face, but hitting right next to you into the wall, imparting that fear you know, breaking the chair, breaking your phone, breaking stuff, selling your stuff, giving it away. It's disrespecting you. It's making you afraid. You see, even the medical insurance, you know, you're under, under my insurance, you leave, you're going to have no care, you know, um, or even using religion, using your faith, you know, that God is going to punish you or you're going to, you're going to have um, consequences later and all that. There are many different um, types of abuse, not only, not, not minimizing the impact, not only you know, physical, the financial is always there. You know, we, we, we can attest to that. But there are many different ways. They mask it. You know, it's a joke. They, I'm sorry. Easily we can fall into that cycle. I won't do it again, the honeymoon. But, you know, you feel disrespected. You, you're in fear. You don't feel safe. You know, when you say no, it's no. They don't respect that. Those, those are big red flags. So take care of yourself. Thank you, Damaris. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then the last question I just want to pose, um, and Lisa, if you could um, help answer this, um, is what services are available to survivors um, in Rhode Island? Yeah, so I know um, Tanya just mentioned the, um, the, the helpline or the safety line and that you're going to mention, you're going to share the resource at the end for that. Um, but, you know, I think we have lots of, we're fortunate that we're in a small state with lots of agencies that do this work. And so, you know, the agencies have everything from support groups to one-on-one -on -one counseling and advocacy. There's advocates that can help with lots of the barriers that you heard tonight. So there's law enforcement advocates at all of the police stations that can help with reporting and that process. There's court advocates that can help you through the court process, which can sometimes take a really long long time. Um, there's DCYF advocates that can help with that process. We have a school-based advocate um, that, you know, can help with uh, anybody K through 12 or higher ed and kind of bridge the gap from uh, from students and schools and anybody who might be experiencing that because to um, Christy's point earlier around the children who witness violence, we know that there's um, oftentimes you know, other things that come up. So um, there's advocates that work around that. There's also community-based advocates that can meet folks wherever they need to in the community. So if getting out of the house isn't an option, maybe they can meet them at their work or at the supermarket or wherever they are, um, you know, to help out. There's also housing advocates that can help with um, housing, you know, emergency housing, temporary housing, and then also ho hoping to help with folks to get some more permanent housing. Um, so there's there's advocates for that. And then there's also advocates for specific populations that we know are more vulnerable, like immigration. So um, there's immigration advocates that can help with uh, getting visas and, and citizenship. There's also LGBTQ advocates that can help with folks that are trans or non-binary and their shelters as well. Um, there's also a male a men's shelter. A lot of people think that, you know, victims are only women, but we do see male victims as well. So we do also have 
um, you know, LGBTQ coordinators and advocates that can help with men and non-binary folks. And then bilingual advocates, because we know that that's also really important is having advocates that speak multiple languages. Um, and, you know, we do education programs because I think that, you know, was mentioned earlier too, that, you know, it's really important to get education out to young folks to stop with, um, stop the violence. And there's also a summer camp that happens every year for kids who've experienced violence. So, you know, there are some programs that are out there. Um, you know, you don't always have to be involved with the police in order to access programs. And I think somebody mentioned earlier, it takes seven to 11 attempts to leave a relationship. So a lot of these agencies can just help with safety planning too. So even if somebody's going to stay in a relationship, um, and I think this was mentioned by the panel, but just how do we keep people safe if they are staying? And then if they're leaving a relationship, that also puts them at escalated risk. And so um, a lot of the advocates and these agencies can also help with the process of leaving. Um, and again, providing support. So if it's basic needs, there's drop-in centers that they can go and get toiletries. Um, and there's lots of other kinds of supportive services. So I always tell people just reach out and ask for help and, um, and you know, let, let, let folks help you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, so we are now um, just going to share some resources to close out tonight. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank SOAR for your incredible advocacy for lifting up your voices. Um, and we hope that uh, we'll see everyone in the community at um, a, another event. Um, but please feel free to reach out. Um, these are some of the resources, um, some of the member and affiliate members of the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, you can contact any one of the agencies or services that Lisa uh, listed through our statewide helpline, which is 1-800-494-8100 or helplineri.com. And I will be um, sending this out to everyone who attended tonight as well. So you'll have this information um, to refer back to. And then I just want to give a huge, massive thank you to um, Jordan Butterfield of Trinity Rep for helping us to uh, bring Behind Closed Doors back and to um, all of the members who have uh, written Behind Closed Doors from SOAR and to everyone tonight who performed it and um, put your heart and soul into practicing and preparing and, um, and bringing this to the community. Um, we really, really appreciate you. And um, we thank you. So thank you everyone so much for attending tonight. Please feel free to reach out if you have any other questions and um, thank you again. Good night.